Uh, good morning. It's 10 a.m. on the west coast of America. Uh, for some of you, it's afternoon. For those of you on the east coast, it's afternoon. I know that some of you are joining us from Europe where it's evening, and I know that we have colleagues coming in from the southern hemisphere, for some of whom I think it's tomorrow already. So we're a really wide time span. It's really great to have you all here. Um, it's a testimony, I think, there are hundreds of us uh, on this webinar, and I think that's testimony both to our speaker and to our speaker's uh, chosen subject. And so welcome then to the Stanford Text Technologies and University Libraries co-sponsored seminar on fragments and fragmentology. It's the second in a series of three or four online seminars this spring. Uh, I'm here on a glorious sunny California day and I, momentarily we're going to be welcoming Dr. Lisa Fagan Davis. Um, who's uh, on the East Coast in Boston. So we've got you all on mute and invisible. Uh, as lucky for some, I actually found some lipstick this morning, first time in, I don't know, two months. Um, but the way things are gonna go is that um, I'll introduce the event, Lisa will speak for about 40 minutes, and then there's gonna be time for questions that's gonna, that are gonna be monitored and articulated on questioners' behalf. So if you, um, you can see a Q&A panel at the bottom of your webinar screen, you can enter your questions for Lisa as she talks, in that screen and then um, it'll be moderated um, at the end so hopefully there'll be time for everyone to have their questions answered. So let me introduce myself, I'm Elaine Trahan, I'm a Professor of Humanities and of English here at Stanford where I also direct Stanford Text Technologies which is a long-term project involving undergraduates, graduates and postdocs um, and we teach in the history of human communication, uh, especially archival research, uh, digital humanities and manuscript studies. Text Technologies as a series of Stanford University Press, a sequence of funded grants, um, including Digging Deeper, which was a, glo a global MOOC on manuscript studies. We have an NEH funded Stanford Global Currents and Hewlett Packard funded Cyber Text Technologies and lots of research assistantships for students. We host early career fellowships, major collegiate and bookmaking workshops, and Text Technologies has a vibrant research relationship with the Center for Spatial and Textual Analysis, uh, which is SESTA, at Stanford and with Stanford University Libraries. Um, and a key collaborator for all of this work is Dr. Benjamin Allbritton, who is the moderator behind the scenes here and who's the rare books curator at Stanford Libraries. Um, he's gonna organize uh, the seminar and ask the questions at the end. He's a medievalist and musicologist and spent nearly a decade managing digital projects, including Parker on the Web, uh, collaborations with the Vatican Library and others and playing a key role in the inception and development of the international image interoperability framework, IIIF and Mirador. And Ben is the editor of a forthcoming volume, Medieval Manuscripts in Digital Age with Routledge, which emerged from a text technologies collegium on Parker on the Web that we held at SESTA. SESTA is the usual office for Dr. Agnieszka Backman, who's a Wallenberg postdoctoral fellow at Stanford Text Technologies. Um, and she was the inspiration for the creation of this seminar. She's here for two years. She did her PhD at Uppsala, where she worked on medieval Swedish manuscript culture, and this is published in her monograph on Fru Elin's book. Her current research is on digital materiality and multimodality, and on the forms and functions of online manuscript repositories, the way that data is curated and displayed. So she initiated this Text Technologies SUL series of online seminars. It began in early April with Bill Endres's seminar on digital image manipulation, and it continues today with Lisa Fagan Davis's talk. And so to Lisa. Uh, she's going to talk about fragments and fragmentology in the 21st century and she's known to many of us as the Executive Director of Medieval Academy of America where she's responsible for ongoing positive and dynamic change and I think everyone who has met her or had any correspondence with her will know what a breath of fresh air she is. She received her PhD in medieval studies from Yale and she's catalogued medieval manuscript collections at Yale, at Penn, at the Walters, and numerous other public and private collections. Her publications include a study of a Gottschalk antiphonary, uh, which came out from CUP in 2000, and the monograph, La Chronique Anonyme Universelle, Reading and Writing History in 15th Century France, which came out from Breckles in 2015. Lisa knows as much as any scholar, I think, on North American and Canadian manuscripts in collections across the continent. She co-authored the Directory of Pre-1600 Manuscripts in the United States and Canada, published online. And in 2016, she co-curated the major exhibition, Beyond Words, Illuminated Manuscripts in Boston Collections, which um, uh, was in Boston at three different sites. Uh, it was absolutely amazing. Many of us are familiar with her wonderful blog series, Manuscript Road Trip, where she tours 
virtually, I think. It's very convincing that she, she tours library collections throughout the state, focusing often on fragments in those collections. And on that website, Manuscript Road Trip, so just Google it, she also posts her occasional Twitter series on breakfast paleography. So you can also follow Lisa on Twitter. She's um, there most days. So Lisa, numerous colleagues and her students have also been responsible for important work on the reconstruction of the Beauvais missile. Again, Google it. Um, it's available online. And I think Ben and I will put a page with links to all of this work and the series um, after the seminar. Lisa's currently undertaking extensive research on a Voynich manuscript, which will be published in numerous venues, including a monograph in the next year or two. So today we're going to learn about fragments and fragmentology in the 21st century. It's a subject of incredible importance and interest, and we're glad that you're here with us to learn from Lisa about the history and significance of those bits and pieces of written heritage that so reveal so much about literate cultures of the past. It's my great pleasure, and I'm clapping, and I know many of us are, uh, to welcome Lisa Fagan Davis. Lisa, take it away. Thank you so much, Elaine. Uh, I'm so grateful to you and Ben and Agnieszka for uh, facilitating the webinar. And I'm, I'm overwhelmed by how many people have shown up. I'm so grateful to all of you for your interest and uh, for being here today. I hope that wherever you are in the world, that you're healthy, that you're safe, and that you're doing whatever you need to do to keep yourself and your, uh, and your community safe as well. So the first thing I wanna do is, uh, well, I'll share my screen. There we go. I wanna start by introducing you to some resources uh, that you may find useful as you encounter and work with manuscript fragments yourself. I've posted links to many of the collections I'm gonna be discussing today on this uh, shared Google Doc. Uh, here's the URL, bit.ly slash 2VJ3I3W, that's an I there, not a one or an L. Uh, and let me open that up and I can just walk you through really quickly what I have, um, what I've put there. Uh, so on, uh, in this document, you will find uh, lots of links to collections that I'm going to share with you today. I've added a little triple IF logo. We'll talk about triple IF a little bit later. Uh, and links to various resources um, for you to use and follow up on if you're interested. I've also added my, uh, a little bibliography and my contact information just in case you want to reach out afterwards or maybe send me some images of some fragments that you own or uh, that you've encountered along the way. I'm always happy to look at fragments um, and um, talk about them with people. Uh, I've also added a link here to uh, a page of my blog uh, where I have posted lots of uh, my go-to online open access research resources lots here um, to help you identify texts, to help you understand liturgical manuscripts, all sorts of things here, and some uh, bibliography as well. Please feel free to share these documents, share these links, and of course you're more than welcome to screenshot, live tweet, and generally share any part of this presentation that you find interesting. Uh, it is also being recorded and will be available online soon. So now back to the slides, here we go. So manuscript uh, fragments and cuttings and single leaves are often overlooked as unimportant or too difficult to identify and catalog. But they're extremely important, relics of the medieval world. Untold numbers of manuscripts didn't survive the Middle Ages and fragments of thousands of them can be seen and studied today with the potential to add significantly to our understanding of liturgy, of art, music, literature, science, provenance, many, many other fields, and codicology, of course. They're hiding in early modern bindings in the stacks, or maybe in a box under somebody's desk that's been overlooked, or hanging on the wall of a hallway that you've probably walked by every day on your way to class. I hope that when we get to the end of this webinar, you will feel the same appreciation for these little survivors that I do, and that you'll feel empowered to do some research on your own. I uh, began working with manuscript fragments some 30 years ago when I was a graduate student at Yale. I knew when I got to Yale that I really wanted to spend my life working with manuscripts. 
And so rather than working as a teaching assistant, I had a job at the Beinecke Rare Book and Manuscript Library uh, as the assistant to the curator of pre-1600 manuscripts at that time, Robert Babcock. I spent several years researching, cataloging, and even conducting conservation work on hundreds of manuscript fragments as part of my job. So all of these fragments are um, pieces that I studied. And I came away from that project really convinced of the importance of making these little bits and pieces available for research and teaching and giving them a little dignity back in the process. They'd been cut, glued, pasted, ripped, torn, taped. They'd had all sorts of terrible things happen to them. And by giving them a little attention, we can preserve uh, what they originally were. I even found a dissertation in that box of fragments. Uh, I did a detailed study and a reconstruction of this manuscript, the Gottschalk and Tiffanol, a 12th century manuscript from Lombach in Upper Austria, whose leaves are now scattered. Since that time, I've handled and cataloged hundreds of fragments, cuttings, and single leaves, and I've traveled the country virtually and in reality to identify, find, catalog, uh, and study these little survivors. Today, there are more than um, 30,000 fragments, leaves, and cuttings in more than 500 North American collections. So there is a lot of work to do. So let's get after it in four parts. Binding waste, cuttings, leaves, and then we'll put it all together with some digital fragmentology. Now, I'm not going to get into the ethics of fragments, uh, fragment collecting. Uh, I don't have time, but that may come up in the Q&A, and I'm always happy to discuss that particular issue because it's extremely important. Number one, binding waste. It was very common in the early modern and late medieval period for binders to recycle parchment from older, damaged, or out-of-date manuscripts for use uh, as binding structures, a much more economic solution than killing a perfectly good animal to make new parchment. We can hardly judge them for this frugality, especially because for most manuscripts, there was as yet no sense that they had an intrinsic value as ancient objects. By the 15th century, earlier scripts were out of date and possibly not even legible anymore. Musical notation had changed dramatically. Liturgical books got replaced as reforms come into play. And of course, books fall apart from use. So first of all, books need covers. And old parchment was a common choice. Certainly, these are the easiest binding fragments to spot in your own library's rare book collection. You need only wander the stack, scanning spines, and you will certainly find them. Who knows, you might even find a fragment of a Carolingian Bible. In this example from Northern Michigan, you can see how the leaf wraps around the spine from front to back. If we look at the inner boards of this example at Harvard, you can see how these leaves are adhered. If you can see my uh, pointer, these tabs wrap around the boards uh, and are adhered and secured by a paste down on top of them, in this case, uh, a piece of paper. Such covers then have a very distinctive shape when they're removed from the binding. In this example from the Boston Public Library, you can easily identify the tabs that wrapped around the boards, the front and the back covers of the book, and the spine right here on which the title of the host volume uh, was written. Fragments might also be used to line and protect the spine of a book. This fragment runs from the front board to the back between the sewn spine and the outer leather. Fragments might also be used as a paste down, securing those leather turn-ins from the cover, as in this example in Dublin's Marsh's Library. When paste downs are removed, they too may show the signs of that use. In this uh, example, this tab would have wrapped around the first gathering of the book to emerge as a little tab between the first and second gathering. And the leather has left a very distinctive pattern of staining around the perimeter. Sometimes fragments are hidden deep within the structure of the binding. 
such as these small pieces that fill in the space between the cords of the spine. This book was actually hiding fragments of a Carolingian manuscript, and they were only visible because the spine happened to fall off. I should add now that multispectral imaging and X-ray fluorescence technology are starting to make it possible to see, to image and visualize hidden fragments without disbanding the host volume. It's very exciting stuff. I've added a link to an article by Eric Quackle on this topic uh, in the Google Doc. When removed, such spine liners might also show these distinctive slits cut to make space for the cords. So once you have an understanding of how fragments are used in bindings, you can quickly learn how to read the signs of use and recover something about the history of the fragment. The book from which binding waste is removed may also show signs of this bibliographic symbiosis. A paste down, for example, might leave behind a mirror image, a ghostly offset, when it is peeled off of the board. This particular offset in a Beinecke incunable is actually quite legible. Well, once you rotate it and uh, invert it. This offset was discovered and imaged by Professor Elizabeth Hebbard of Indiana University. And when she showed it to me, I recognized it immediately as a still missing leaf of none other than the Gottschalk Antiphonary. The offset had been in the stacks at the Beinecke the whole time I was in graduate school, but no one had ever seen it before because no one had looked. So that's takeaway number one. Go survey your early bindings because you never know what you might find. Sometimes if you're lucky, you can even identify the missing fragment by studying the offset, the text of the offset, as well as the uh, stains and wormholes and other damage. In this particular case, I was able to identify the paste down that had been removed from this binding as being part of the Beinecke's collection. And I also wrote a blog post about another such discovery just last week. All right, so let's move on to part two, cuttings. So as I said at the beginning, I don't think that we should judge harshly medieval binders for recycling old, damaged, or out-of-date manuscripts for binding waste. They were being frugal, preserving valuable resources. But for this next part, we can start judging. With the increase of interest in collecting and studying antiquities in the 18th and 19th centuries, medieval manuscripts become prized as ancient artifacts and examples of artistry. Many collectors were more interested in the art than in the text, and dealers and owners alike developed a rather nasty habit of cutting out initials and miniatures and selling them as tiny little works of art. Throughout the 19th century, collectible illuminated initials and miniatures were cut out close to the borders, the remnant text often discarded. As antiquarian John Ruskin once famously wrote in his diary, cut up a missile this evening, hard work. This practice resulted in sales and collections of freestanding, tightly cropped initials, arranged cuttings adhered to what was almost certainly highly acidic paper, and elaborate collages like this one uh, that belongs to the University of Pennsylvania. The practice also left behind codices that look like this. Even so, some of the greatest works of art from the Middle Ages and the Renaissance survive as cuttings, as seen in the Burke Collection on deposit at Stanford University. Now here, we actually have a collection that is not just cuttings, but also includes uh, single leaves like these. In examples where you have a whole leaf, it's possible to determine something about the host codex. You can read the liturgy, you can analyze the music, so you can determine what kind of manuscript it was and uh, determine the specific liturgy preserved on these leaves. However, once a cutting is removed from its original context, all of that data, all of that information uh, is almost certainly lost, unless you look at the back. So that's takeaway number two always look at the back, turn it over and see what you can find. So this is a really beautiful initial Christ blessing. But if we open up our thumbnails and we look at the back, 
we can actually learn something about this cutting that we can't learn from just looking at the front. The script is an Italian Gothic rotunda, uh, and the music indicates that it was a choir book. The rubric CO up here stands for communion. So that tells us that we're looking at a choir book for mass. A choir book for mass is more commonly known as a gradual. Now don't panic if you don't know that off the top of your head, if you don't know the difference between say a gradual and an antiphonal, because there are links on my blog website uh, on the resources page that will help you learn how to make those distinctions for yourself. So now we know this is an Italian gradual, something we couldn't tell from just looking at the front. And by using the research resources linked from my blog, you may even be able to identify the specific part of the liturgy represented by these little bits of text. But do spend some time looking at the art because it's pretty spectacular. So now let's move on. Let's see, come back. There we are. Let's move on to single leaves. Now we can really get judgmental. In the early 20th century, booksellers came to the realization that they would make a lot more money if they broke manuscripts apart, selling 250 leaves to 250 buyers instead of one book to one buyer. This was a particularly American calculus, I'm sorry to say, capitalism run amok. And so US dealers began breaking books and selling them off page by page. What dealers broke, collectors bought. The United States, with its industry-fueled wealth, was a primary beneficiary of this flooded market. From masters of industry to small town collectors, major museums to small colleges, bibliophiles in the United States were clamoring for matted and framed leaves. In particular, leaves from Gothic books of hours and psalters and such, and Italian choir books. Today, there are tens of thousands of whole leaves from thousands of dismembered manuscripts in hundreds of North American collections. The most notorious of these book breakers was Otto Frederick Egge, bibliophile and self-proclaimed biblioclast. Egge spent most of his career in the 20s, 30s, and 1940s as a professor of art history at the Cleveland Institute of Art. He was a collector of manuscripts, but he was also a book dealer. He is best known for breaking apart hundreds of manuscripts and early printed books in the 1930s and 40s, selling them off leaf by leaf in a massive profit. Eggy defended his biblioclasm in this 1938 article in a hobbyist journal called Avocations. Book terrors, he wrote, have been cursed and condemned but have they ever been praised or justified? No, they haven't. Surely, he continued, to allow a thousand people to have and to hold an original manuscript leaf and to get the thrill and understanding that comes only from actual and frequent contact with these art heritages is justification enough for the scattering of fragments. Few indeed can hope to own a complete manuscript book Hundreds, however, may own a leaf." Unquote. His destructive and irreparable actions were certainly misguided, but he was correct in one important respect. Collections throughout North America that could never have afforded to buy entire codices are today the proud possessors of significant teaching collections of medieval manuscript leaves. In fact, several thousand leaves from several hundred manuscripts that passed through Eggie's hands can now be identified in at least 115 North American institutional collections. In other words, more than 10% of the entire corpus of single leaves in the United States can be traced back to Otto Eggie. And I'm not even counting leaves in private hands, many of which are not yet known to researchers. For laying the groundwork of Eggy's studies, we must thank scholars like Barbara Shaler and Consuelo Dutchke, Frank Porcheru and Christopher de Hamel, among others. 
If you want to learn more about Eggy and his biblioclastic ways, you can also refer to the recent monograph by Scott Guara titled Otto Eggy's Manuscripts. The full reference is in the shared Google Doc. And there's quite a lot of information about Eggy and Eggy manuscripts in my blog as well. Eggy used the leaves from several dozen manuscripts to create thematic portfolios for sale. In other words, he would take one leaf of this manuscript, one leaf of that one, one leaf of a third, and then combine them to create a pile, a deck of manuscript leaves, each of which was from a different codex. The most common of these portfolios are titled 50 Original Leaves from Medieval Manuscripts, Original Leaves from Famous Bibles, and Original Leaves from Famous Books. The leaves were taped into custom mats with a distinctive red fillet border and Eggy's handwritten notes across the bottom, identified with Eggy's letterpress label, and stored in custom buckram boxes. Because the leaves in these portfolios are always sequenced the same way, number five in one portfolio comes from the same manuscript as number five in every other portfolio of the same name. For example, there were 40 such boxes titled 50 Original Leaves of Medieval Manuscripts, 28 of which have been located. And in these 28 boxes, we have 28 leaves from each of those 50 manuscripts. The Eggy portfolios therefore represent a coherent and intrinsically American corpus of leaves that can be affiliated with a discrete number of manuscripts, a feature that presents us with some very exciting possibilities and sends us into part four, digital fragmentology. In the early years of the 20th century, the 20, 20th, the 21st century, I mean, scholars began to realize the potential for the burgeoning, uh, of burgeoning digital technologies for the virtual reconstruction of dismembered manuscripts, now known as digital fragmentology. In 2003, Barbara Shaler, who was at the time the director of the Beinecke Library, issued a call to arms, writing, for auto eggy fragments now dispersed across the world, the possibilities presented by modern technology are fascinating. It is only a matter of time. Financial resources and scholarly communication and perseverance before significant portions of Eggy's intriguing collection will be reassembled and made available electronically. After several fits and starts, time, financial resources, and scholarly communication and perseverance have finally, 17 years later, made the vision of virtual reconstruction a reality. Technology has caught up with our dreams in the form of IIIF compliant shared canvas interoperability. Don't panic, I'll break it down for you. IIIF, the International Image Interoperability Framework, is a way of presenting digital images in an online environment that allows them to be shared via a persistent URL instead of by downloading and uploading them into a silo. There's more to it than that, of course, but that's the basic idea. In other words, if an online image is IIIF compliant, it can be manifested into a workspace known as a shared canvas, simply by pointing to the IIIF persistent URL. The image is then drawn into the canvas when called for, rather than being physically stored there. This interoperability has the advantage of enabling a user to apply their own metadata and annotations and sequence images without transforming the original image file in any way. An image can be stored in one place while being used in multiple workspaces. The model is completely open access and it avoids siloing and is thus in keeping with digital best practices. See, that wasn't so hard. For fragmentology, IIIF facilitates some truly remarkable outcomes. Remember this poor corpse of a codex? Well, here is the missing miniature. Our friends at Biblissima, this amazing project in France, have used IIIF functionality to restore the miniature digitally to its proper place. And there's a link to this demo also uh, in the Google Doc. Meanwhile, at Stanford, back in 2016, Rare Books curator Benjamin Albritton, one of our hosts for today, 
who has been instrumental in developing and promoting IIIF and the associated Mirador viewer, first implemented a brilliant idea that has made Shaler's prophecy a reality. Ben used these leaves of an Eggy manuscript in Stanford's collection to create a virtual reconstruction of the manuscript by mirroring images of leaves from other institutions into a shared canvas viewer alongside them. So let me show you how IIIF makes this kind of uh, digital reconstruction possible. Let's close that. Let's get rid of the ones we don't need. Close that and we will close that. Okay, so now I wanna go here and open this up. All right, so what we're looking at now is uh, an eggy leaf that belongs to Stanford. This is a page of Peter Riga's Aurora. It's a versified um, biblical, versified version of the Bible. And this manuscript was dismembered by Otto Eggy nearly a century ago. Leaves from this manuscript are number seven in the 50 original, uh, 50 leaf, original leaves of medieval manuscripts boxes. So if your institution owns one of those portfolios, this a leaf from this manuscript will be number seven in the box. There are at least 30 uh, known leaves of this manuscript, probably more than that, in fact, scattered around North America. So here is one from the University of Colorado. Uh, and here is another from, uh, the, uh, from Stony Brook University in New York. Both of these are, and the Stanford, they're all IIIF compliant, which is, of course, why I chose them. Stanford displays its leaves uh, in a IIIF compliant viewer, the Mirador viewer. And one of the advantages of this viewer is that it allows you to add uh, windows to the viewer in which you can compare other IIIF images. Now, this doesn't save. This is just a temporary workspace. Uh, and if your institution is putting images online in a IIIF compliant way, if they've done their job uh, correctly, they'll make it easy for users to use, to take advantage of that IIIF functionality uh, and interoperability. In this case, in Colorado, if you click on the share button, you get a little pop-up and here's your IIIF uh, per persistent URL, which you can then copy, go over here, add an item, put the URL there and load it up and voila, there it is. So now uh, that's our first one from Colorado. At uh, Stony Brook, they've made sharing these leaves even easier because when you click on your little share pop-up, you get an actual drag, click and draggable IIIF logo. So all you have to do is pick that up and just drop it into uh, the viewer. And so now we have three in a row. So we've already got three images from this same manuscript, three leaves in three different collections, Colorado, California, and New York, that we can put side by side. And now we can zoom in, we can start comparing the, the script, we can start putting this manuscript back together. So I hope you can see that uh, the potential here and why this is so exciting and the potential for digitally reconstructing manuscripts. Um, if you would like to uh, experiment and play around with this methodology yourself, there are lots of links in the Google Doc uh, for you to explore and get to know IIIF, get to know Mirador and other shared canvas viewers, and uh, get a sense of how this works and what it can do for you. you. Um, and for those of you who don't want to have to figure it out on your own, uh, I do have some, uh, some good news. So let's go back to the slideshow. A recently launched project, a resource called Fragmentarium, takes care of the technical details for you. And so the era of do-it-yourself fragmentology has arrived. Fragmentarium is a project developed by the Swiss team of codecologists and coders who brought you ecodices, spearheaded by Christoph Fuller and William Duba. It is a digital research laboratory for working with medieval manuscript fragments. It enables libraries, collectors, and researchers and students to publish images of medieval manuscript fragments, 
catalog them, describe them, transcribe, assemble, reuse them. Fragmentarium takes advantage of IIIF functionality to easily allow users to upload and catalog and arrange leaves here simply by dragging and dropping in order to create digital reconstructions like this one, uh, a reconstruction of a lovely early 15th century book of hours that was dismembered by Otto Eggy. This was undertaken by my students at the Simmons University School of Library and Information Science. Uh, I use Fragmentarium also not just in my classroom, but also in my own work reconstructing the Beauvais Missal, a late 13th century manuscript that was broken up by Eggy in 1942. If you go to the Fragmentarium website, uh, you can see all of these by searching for reconstructions. Today, there are tens of thousands of known fragments and leaves in several hundred North American collections and hundreds of thousands more worldwide. And I'm not even counting private collections yet. Uh, raise your hand, don't be shy. How many of you have a leaf or two hanging on your wall? I do, I admit it. Those count. Oh wait, I'm looking, everybody's raising their hands. We've got a lot of hands going up. Wow, 20, 21, keep going, keep going. Raise your hands, keep going. I'm curious now to see, there's a lot. All right, so we've got, uh, we're so far at uh, 40, 45 people who raised their hands. I'm sure it's more than that. Those count. What you have hanging on your wall, that counts and will be of interest. Send the images around, post them online, put them out there for students and scholars to work with. There are thousands of unknown fragments and leaves in collections and private hands that may turn out to be extremely important but we can't know that until we can see them, until we can work with them in some way. So how can you help identify, find, catalog, and promote these collections? Number one, first stop, check the Conway Davis directory of institutions in the United States and Canada with pre-1600 manuscript holdings to see if your institution's collection is listed there. If it isn't, please let me know. And my co-author, Melissa Conway, and I will add your institution to uh, the update that will be coming out uh, eventually as an online update. Number two, use the resources uh, on my website. I have an Eggy field guide that uh, allows you to search um, for your leaves in a list, among a list of uh, Eggy material to see if one of uh, your leaves is in fact a leaf that can be identified uh, with Eggy, in which case it can absolutely be part of efforts to digitally reconstruct those manuscripts. And you'll also find resources there that will help you catalog your leaves. Image and upload your leaves in fragments, even if you have minimal metadata. If you don't have the foggiest idea what it is you have, other it's enough to know you have it. That's fine. It doesn't, you don't have to know everything about it or even anything about it before you make it available for study. All you need is a shelf mark or some kind of identifier so that users can properly cite your fragment. So please, please, please image and upload leaves and fragments in an open access uh, way. Flickr is useful that way if you don't have any other way to do it. We have come a long, long way since I first sat on the floor of my living room, piecing the Gottschalk antiphonal together using photocopies, scissors, and paste. In 2013, nearly 30 years later, I was able to use Fragmentarium to digitally reconstruct the Gottschalk antiphonal in living, triple IF compliant, beautiful, high resolution, open access color. And it was pretty thrilling. And what I've shown you today are just a few examples of what these technologies and methodologies can enable, facilitating not only discoverability, but research and pedagogy as well. Fragments have so much to tell us. We just have to learn to listen. We have to find them, image them, and make them available. There's a lot of work to do, but I hope that you'll join me and my colleagues in the manuscript world as we work to get it done. Thank you very much. Happy to 
start a discussion and take some questions. But I think I will stop sharing my screen first so you don't have to stare at this. There we are. Well, thank you so much, Lisa. That was a, a wonderful talk. And we've got thank questions you. starting to stack up in Q&A. Okay. Uh, so why don't we just run through them in order, if that's all right with you? Sure, absolutely. Okay. Uh, first question is, how prevalent today is the practice of disassembling codices and selling pages? Well, so that is the $100,000 question. Um, there are a lot of the practice definitely still happens. And if you uh, follow Peter Kidd's blog, Manuscript Provenance, you'll see his most recent blog post was in fact about a manuscript that was sold, I believe in 2012 as a complete codex and is now in pieces. So it absolutely still happens. And it's, it's why, you know, we're gonna get into the, the ethical questions. It should not happen anymore. We all should know better. These are precious, rare, unique, they're manuscripts, that each one is absolutely unique. It shouldn't happen anymore, but it does. And that's why if you're gonna buy leaves, my recommendation would always be to really push the dealer uh, about the provenance of the leaf you're interested in. If they can tell you it was broken up by Otto Eggy or Philip Duchenez or, or one of the other dealers a hundred years ago, buy it, absolutely. But if they can't tell you, if they can't assure you that it wasn't broken up yesterday or five years ago, then uh, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't give them the money. You know, we don't, wanna, we don't wanna encourage the practice. There are enough leaves out there already from books that were broken a hundred years ago to keep the market humming for, you know, for decades. There's no reason that we need new leaves um, on the market for collectors. Great. Uh, next question is, how early is the practice of using components of previous manuscripts as binding elements of a new manuscript? How early are our earliest examples of this practice? The, the earliest examples that I've seen tend to be in 15th century bindings, but some of that may be because those there are a, a huge number of bindings earlier than that that survive. I've seen a lot of 12th century bindings in my own work, but if those have binding fragments in them, the fragments are almost always later than the 12th century. So obviously they were added later. I have yet to find anything. I, I don't think I've ever seen a binding earlier than the 15th century that had binding fragments in it. Um, others may have had a different experience, but I, I believe that, that, that I, I would say probably around the 15th century. Uh, next question is, just for information, who was Peter Riga and where was he from? Oh, good heavens, I have no idea. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm sure that Wikipedia can answer that question. We'll come back to that one on Twitter then. <laughs> uh, next question then from John Chapman in Durham. Are you aware of the studies of fragments of artifacts and human bodies in archaeology? Uh, we have been working on this since 1997 with two fragmentation books. So comparison between oh, yeah, archaeological and... Let me look mm -hmm. into that. Thank you. Great. Um, okay, uh, next question from... Uh, in view of the thousands of fragments located in so many libraries in the USA, is there a tentative catalog, at least of the libraries holding fragments and hopefully their language? I search fragments written in Portuguese, knowing that most of the fragments are written in Latin. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I think you, you started to talk about this with, um, with the Conway Davis uh, catalog. Yeah, so, so what, what we've done is really, um, it, it is literally a census, it's about counting. So if you go to the directory, what you'll see is for different collections, how many uh, codices versus fragments they reported to us. It's not a catalog necessarily. Uh, so we're not giving details about, it's not like Derici where we're give, um, giving uh, any kind of cataloging data. Um, the majority of fragments that you're gonna find are gonna be Latin. Um, you'll find a lot of documents. So you might find um, documents in uh, the vernacular uh, being used as, as fragments. But in terms of books being broken apart, it's pretty rare to find something in French or German or, or Portuguese or Spanish. They certainly exist, but they're, they're difficult to find. They're, they're rare, I think. Uh, can we use IIIF 
for uniting the fragments used for binding with more intact fragments? Or is that something that's still in process? Definitely, you can do that. If you, it's something that, that Fragmentarium takes into account uh, in situ fragments as uh, combining those with ex situ fragments from the same manuscript. So again, if you go to uh, explore Fragmentarium, the website is fragmentarium.ms. If you go to Fragmentarium and just start exploring, you'll see all sorts of different kinds of fragments from binding fragments that have been removed that are ex situ binding fragments that are still in the bindings that have been imaged and uploaded and cataloged. Uh, so that's in the C2, plus single leaves, plus cuttings, of every, every variety uh, of fragments um, are being input into Fragmentarium and they welcome additional collections. If you have a collection of fragments and you wanna become a Fragmentarium cataloger, they would love to have your collection. The more fragments go in, the better the discoverability, the more likely we are to start making um, to start making those matches. All right, the next question was wondering if there's anyone working on image analysis algorithms to identify hands or volumes so as to reconstruct lost manuscripts. Yes, uh, <laughs> yes, indefinitely. So uh, the um, uh, uh in France, in Paris, has a project uh, going on right now that Dominique Stutzman is one of the PIs on um, for on just exactly that question. To be able to do sort of some preliminary sorting of thousands and th among thousands of images saying, well, these two look to the computer, look roughly similar, and then you have the human come in and, and eyeball them to see whether they are or are not exactly the same. It's pretty exciting. Uh, it would be pretty great, and it would certainly help narrow the narrow the field uh, in terms of being able to make those to make those matches. Okay. Uh, the next question is: What is the disadvantage of reuniting these leaves and digitally recreating the codex? I I don't think there is one. I don't think I could. I don't see any. I don't see any disadvantage to it. Um, you know, you'll never be able to reunite them physically. Although I will say that that David Gura at uh, Notre Dame in Indiana is actually trying to do that with um, a book of hours that was broken up fairly recently. He's actually literally buying the pages for the university as they come on the market and literally trying to put the book back together. But that's extremely rare that you would have the opportunity to do that. The only way we're ever going to see these books uh, back together is to um, uh, is to do it digitally. That's the only way it's going to happen. Um, and even if you know some of these books that, well, looking at Eggy, for example, some of the books he broke up, you know, they're not the book of Kells, right? You know, they're not uh, the hours of the Duc de Berry or you know the Trévisure. They're, some of them are not such fantastic manuscripts, but every one of them is unique and every one of them adds to our understanding of liturgy and liturgical practice uh, in the Middle Ages and art historical. Plus, they offer an amazing opportunity for pedagogy, these kind of reconstruction projects. There's no better way to learn how to understand the structure of a book of hours than by trying to piece one back together. I found in my class that that, that project teaches so much about how to work with liturgy and how to um, how to understand the structure of the manuscript. So there, there's a, even if the book itself, the final reconstructed book is nothing to write home about, it still has provided this incredible um, learning and teaching experience. So I, I find it extremely valuable regardless of the outcome. Uh, the next question is on the conservation side of things. Uh, mm -hmm. And the writer is wondering about uh, whether fragments should be left inside of a binding or if they should be removed. Uh, and do you think we should have a sort of ethical guideline on that topic? It's a great question. And there, there probably are ethical guidelines among conservators about that. But I think often it's a, it, it, it is just a judgment call. So sometimes it's better for the fragment for it to stay in place. Uh, because sometimes if you, as, as you've seen from the examples I showed, when you remove it, it suffers damage. The, the text may peel off. 
the the the, man, the fragment may tear. It's you know they're they're glued in place. They're adhered quite solidly, either sewn or uh, or with some kind of adhesive. So sometimes it's not in the best interest of the leaf to remove them, especially if you can image it in place and still work with it that way. If the book is being conserved and rebound anyway, then you might have an opportunity to safely uh, remove it um, so that you can see both sides, for example. Um, but it, I think it's really up to the individual conservator to decide uh, and curators to decide what's best, uh, what they think is best and what their individual strategy is going to be. Great. Uh, next question then is on the topic of image analysis algorithms for collections with large numbers of small fragments uh, or various sizes, is there a tool out there that can identify size and shape, uh, something maybe related to open computer vision, open CV or anything like that? Um, well, so, I, you know, I wish I knew, off the, could remember off the top of my head what the Irashte um, project URL was, and uh, I, will, uh, I will look it up when we're done here and I will tweet it out again. I tweeted about it a few days ago uh, where I said, oh my gosh, we're all in danger of being replaced by an algorithm. <laughs> uh, and then I was assured that the humans will still be uh, an important part of the process. Uh, so as soon once uh, once we're done here, I will I will retweet that so that everyone can can see that the the work they're doing along those lines. Great, and I think um, the various Geniza projects as well have have something that they've been using. Oh yeah, on, on uh, Zooniverse, right? It's on. I think it's a Zooniverse project. They do have that there, right? Uh, next question then: uh, Do North American repositories face a backlash from European collections who feel uh, that the manuscripts actually belong in Europe? Uh, maybe I, I I've not heard it expressed explicitly. Um, you know, the for the most part, the manuscripts made their way here um, through the book market. There are, of course, manuscripts that are that are looted or manuscripts that made their way here uh, through other means. Um, manuscripts do get uh, repatriated um, fairly regularly. You hear uh, I was involved in the, the investigation and repatriation of a, of a manuscript a few years ago. Um, and so that that certainly happens if and there are all sorts of the, the the laws governing uh, repatriation are really complicated, I, I learned, uh, and they really vary depending on who the two countries are and when the, uh, if it was a theft, when the theft happened. If something was stolen from Italy in the 16th century, it may still have to be returned. If it was stolen from, um, from France in the 18th century, it might not have to be returned. You know, I mean, it, it really, it varies so much whether there's a claim and whether, um, and whether, uh, and even if it's a voluntary repatriation, you still have, they still have to do a legal investigation. You can't just say, here's your book back. Uh, it definitely, there still has to be an investigation and lawyers have to be involved and it, it's a very long drawn out, complicated process. Uh, but it does happen. Um, it certainly does happen. Um, how can private collectors most effectively share their fragments? I would say by, um, by uploading them to Flickr, because Flickr is free. Uh, I believe, Ben, it's IIIF now, right? Mm, we could definitely confirm that. I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I, I think that Flickr is now IIIF compliant, so that it enables that kind of interoperability and sharing that we're looking for. Uh, it's free. Anyone can set up an account and upload images. It's a, a really easy way for individuals who don't have an uh, institutional server. Um, to, to put images up and a little bit of metadata with them if you want, you, you know, you can add an image title that that's just an identifier. If you want to add it, if you know anything about it, you can add a little bit of metadata there too. So that's, I think, a good, uh, uh, a good resource to use. And there's a follow up question on that topic, which is, what do you think the future of Flickr is as an outreach and distribution platform? Well, I, I think it's really terrific. Um, resource as long as it stays open access. Um, you know, I, I don't know what the diff, you know, I don't use it regularly for myself, so I don't know offhand what the, the limits are of it and what kind of advertising there is or what the different levels of access are. So it, there may be some, it may be more complicated than I'm, than I'm thinking off the top of my head. 
uh, you may have to pay if you want uh, no advertising or if you want to have access to more, more metadata. Uh, I'm not really sure. Uh, next question then. Are you finding digitization teams are becoming better at color management? Mm. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, the, the best images are those that have a color bar uh, alongside them or and a ruler. Ideally, you want a color bar and a ruler. Um, so that at least you have a sense of scale, right? One of the big problems with putting an image online is that you, you often don't know what the scale is. Those, those um, thumbnails that I showed you from the Burke collection, you can't really tell just from looking at the thumbnails, the scale of those choir book leaves compared to the cuttings. They all look like they were the same size, but in fact, the choir book leaves are probably three feet tall and two feet wide, whereas the cuttings might be, you know, like this. Um, and so it's very important to have a ruler and a color bar, um, some way of gauging the, uh, the standard that you're looking at. And if you look at my Beauvais Missile reconstruction, you'll see a huge variety in the quality of the images because a lot of them were done years ago. Uh, and there is, uh, there is definitely a, um, a lot of variety um, and hard to get a sense of what the true color is unless you have those kind of standards. What are the implications of IIIF for the future of fragmentology? Would the end goal be to eventually reconstruct these manuscripts in some physical form as well as digitally? Uh, I don't think so. I, I think a lot of the, I mean, in order to reconstruct them physically, you're gonna have to bring them together in one place. And I, I don't see that that's a, a viable option. So many fragments belong to private collectors or they belong to, you know, institutions scattered all over the world. Uh, I, I, don't see, I don't see a physical repository, but the great thing about IIIF is that it allows you to create uh, in the virtual world a repository without actually taking anything from anyone. You can create this, uh, this virtual reconstruction without um, without actually going and getting uh, an image file and storing it somewhere because it's already stored on Stanford server, for example. So if I want to use it in my own Mirador instance, I'm not, I don't have to take that file and download it and store it someplace. So there, you know, IIIF, it really allows us to do this work in a way that's sustainable which is the real challenge in the digital world, is creating work that is, that's going to last and that can, be, um, that can be archived and that can be easily translated into the next uh, iteration, whatever that is. And, and um, using IIIF allows you to do that. You're not going to be left behind um, as the technology gets upgraded and, and changed. And our colleague Giovanni Scorcioni uh, weighs in on this question. Uh, and Hi, he, says, he says, my two cents from San Marino, it may be interesting to know that there are also some print facsimiles of broken up manuscripts that can relive in their unabridged original format. And he provides a few examples. Ah, thank you. That's wonderful, Giovanni. Thank you for bringing that up. And I hope you're well. All right, uh, next question then. Um, does this reconstruction methodology uh, apply equally to printed book fragments as to manuscript mm -hmm. fragments? So it could, but the trick with the printed book is that you, you, you can rarely be absolutely certain that if you've got page six over there and you've got page 12 over there, it's really hard to ascertain that they're from the same physical volume. You could certainly know they were from the same edition, right? But it's very difficult to say for sure to find the physical evidence that's going to prove that what you're reconstructing is an original volume, uh, an, an original object, uh, an original um, you know, printing, as opposed to just an addition of a particular work. So that's one of the challenges uh, in doing this work with printed books. You certainly could if you weren't worried about um, being certain that all of the pages that you had definitely came from the same volume that was broken up. It's, it's almost impossible to ascertain that unless you're looking at things like, you know, if you've got some kind of edge painting or edge decoration or some kind of physical evidence that ties each page, you know, a foliation written by hand, for example. You know, if you've got something that ties each individual page 
to one uh, known volume, you could certainly uh, you could certainly do that. But but working with printed books that are broken up definitely um, has different challenges than working with manuscripts. Thank you, Lisa. Um, we are coming to the end of our time, and there are still seventeen open questions. I wonder uh, if you would mind if we move this conversation over to Twitter, where you could answer these questions asynchronously. Sure, happy to do that. Wonderful. Yeah, at Lisa F. Davis. So feel free to tweet at me, and I'm I'm always happy to answer questions. Great, and I will copy these and send them over to you uh, in a, a big thread where you can answer Great. all the questions about fragmentology that there might be. Terrific. I look forward um, to it. So let's join together and thank. Dr. Fagan Davis, uh, Professor Traharn, and Dr. Backman for organizing this, and Stanford Text Technologies and Stanford Libraries for hosting. Thank you all for attending, and uh, we'll take this conversation over to Twitter. Thank you all so much. Be safe. <laughs>